Folks, welcome back. Chris Garlock here with Michael Redmond, Nine Don Professional. So good to have our Sunday night live series back. Glad you're with us and hope everybody is safe and uh, staying socially distanced. And I tell you, Michael, I have got a I've got a mask in like everything. I you know, it's in my car, it's in my tennis bag. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> gotta have them all over. How are uh, how are things in Japan? Yeah, well. Um... Actually, just yesterday, uh, there was a pure gold tournament in which oh, I was. Yeah. yeah, so I wanted to talk about that. Please do. Uh, and it was the Kanto area. So that's the area of Tokyo. And in, it also includes some of the neighboring prefectures. So it's a whole Eastern Japan area. Um, and it's the elimination tournament for what would usually be the international pure gold championship that's held right. at the end of the year. And they will help hold it, but I, I don't think they'll be able to um, invite players from overseas this time no. um, because of the, the virus. But they will have the tournament, and it's going to be a, a memor memorial tournament for um, Matsuda Masatake, who was, who was one of the great sponsors. He, he, mm -hmm. he was in the Japanese Japan Rail, Railroads, Railway, I think it's called. Um, so he was the um, president of that company. He was one of the big sponsors. And he was also the president of the Pirago Association. Yeah. So, um, so there, um, uh, he passed away last, uh, I think it was last year. Mm -hmm. And um, so there, this is a mem memorial tournament they're having for him. I think they are going to make an attempt to find some Westerners who are living in Japan. Um, but it's going to be mostly a Japanese tournament. So I, I was in the, uh, the Tokyo Elimination Tournament. I mean, I was refereeing for it. And um, it was interesting. They did have partitions on the over the go board. So oh, there really? Were little stands with um, transparent uh, film, you might say, or plastic um, hanging over the board, and just enough room to put your hand um, over the board. But um, basically, they were positioned to stop people from sneezing on each other or something, or something right. like that. How did they handle the stones, right? I mean, so if you go to capture they some stones. handle the stones, um, like you can capture your opponent's stones, and um, obviously that could be potential risk. Yeah. Uh, but they did give everyone, um, they gave them um, some liquid, to, sanitizing liquid and stuff like that, and little spray bottles about the size of my finger. And so uh -huh. you know, they were doing various things. And of course, everyone was wearing masks. Right. Um, so it was a much smaller tournament. They usually have this big handicap tournament at the same time, even in just Tokyo. Okay. Uh, they, they didn't do that. And so they had a much wider, a larger room for a smaller number of people. In fact, right. I think there were only 16 peers. Oh, wow. That it is much smaller. Like it would be hundreds and hundreds of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's huge. Tournament. Hugely popular in Japan, I know. It's very popular. Um, and especially, actually, the handicap tournaments, which are not um, a preliminary tournament for the World Amateur, even those are very popular. In fact, they might mm -hmm. be more popular um, because it, it's more fun, I suppose, like, to yeah. get the weaker players. Right. Yeah. Let I'm, you know, look, it's, uh, as you know, I'm a huge tennis fan. We just had the U.S. Open. Very, uh, very interesting. Uh, all the top players not playing. So a big opportunity for the younger players. But the oddest thing, you know, apropos what you're talking about, nobody in the stands. So, and New York is always the loudest crowd. And so, uh, you know, we're all trying to just deal with what's going on. And so, uh, just like with the U.S. Open, we're happy to have any tennis back. I'm glad that the uh, the pair go, uh, you know, that they had it, even with a smaller mm -hmm. crowd. Uh, and nobody got sick, I hope. Not yet. Maybe we have to wait two weeks. <laughs> fingers crossed. Fingers well, crossed. Now, you know, I, Michael, yeah. What do you no, think? I understand that you, uh, you had some games recently. I had some games, yeah. Um, I've been playing some tournament games. Um, mixed results. Um, some of them were played over the internet. Like some of the games were actually played 
Um, although we had to go to the, the Go Association mm -hmm. for referees, um, so the referee could watch us, that is. Ah, I see, um, okay. We had to go to the Go Association, but we were not playing face-to-face -face in some of these games. And so we were playing on a computer and actually did a click miss to lose one of those games. You so did. that was embarrassing. <laughs> I, was, I was sort of upset with myself, but like when you're playing on over the internet, sometimes that happens. And my feeling is that like, if you, you have to draw a line somewhere. Um, so if you say that someone can take back a click mix, you have to, then you have to decide um, how to define a click sure. miss and what sure. is the honest mistake. Um, so I was feeling bad about that, but then I have another piece of news of you about the ink cup. The ink cup huh? is up now, and last week it was let's see, it was the eighth and ninth and eleventh of this month, so September. They played three rounds, so they started with thirty players, and so that's a first round with um, twenty-eight players participating, and there's two seats, the the two finalists from the last time, which was four years ago. Um, it's like, it's like the Olympics, like they have it once in every four years. And so they started with that and they got down to the final four players now. Oh, wow. That's fast. That, that's in three rounds. Um, because it's a, it's a direct elimination tournament. I think in the, um, in the last two rounds in the semifinals, I think they will have a best of three or something like that. Um, I should have checked. I'm, I'm not completely sure, but I think it's a best of three in the semifinals. And in the finals, I think it's going to be a best of five. So there's going to be more games there. But they quickly got rid of most of their players. And it was, um, it was interesting. In the first round, there was a player who did a quick miss himself because obviously <laughs> players could not travel to Taiwan. Right. So they were playing remotely also. Right. And, um, it was actually a game played uh, by Ichiriki, who was one of the Japanese players, and uh -huh. Miyu Ting. You might remember Miyu Ting from the AlphaGo. Yes. yes, I do. Uh, he's a world champion. Yeah. Um, it's sort of a click. It was it was one of the more hard to call ones because he took the wrong call. Ah. Uh -huh. And so maybe I, I I would say that the the fact that he was playing on a computer screen probably did make it easier for him to make that kind of mistake, which sure. would probably not happen in a real board situation. Right. Uh, but it, it, it's, I, I also think it's a bit different from calling it a click miss. So it's, it's sort of hard to say. Well, we should, uh, we should maybe do one of those games uh, for our commentary next week. What do you think? Yeah, it's gotten to the third round. Actually on my channel, I, um, I made a selection of some, some of the Japanese games from first and second rounds. Mm. And that's already out, actually. Um, oh, okay. And probably pretty soon, I'll I expect to be um, putting out a game from the third round um, again, the Japanese player. But um, we still have some other games. We could choose a game from the third round, actually. Yeah. Um, just everything is gonna. There's a lot of Chinese players to start with. Um, you might recall that there are a lot of Chinese players who have been world champions. So they, yep. they sort of have a majority in these international tournaments. Um, <laughs> so there's a Chinese player in each pairing. And so you can choose from China against China, China against Korea, or China against Taiwan, which is sort of, um, let, let's just say it's a different uh, professional organization at least. Yeah, no, that's, 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 a, that's a wealth to choose from. So that'll be great. So we will go from a a classic game today to a brand new game next week. I love it. All right. So before we get to that, just a reminder, folks, we are live. So we welcome your questions, your comments, uh, anything that you want to know. Uh, thanks for watching uh, all of these live streams. And also, I know we have a, a lot of people watching uh, on YouTube as well. So thanks for that. But uh, this is your chance uh, to ask your questions and uh, Jared will be screening them and I'll be trying to keep an eye on them as well. All right. So with that, uh, why don't you tell us uh, uh, one of our players, obviously Go Sagan, you should, uh, for those who don't know about Go Sagan, you should talk about that. And then we have another player who maybe not quite as well known, but in my little bit of research, he's a very interesting player. He's a very interesting person. Well, to start with Go Sagan, as you said, Go Sagan is, um, almost universally 
accepted to be a genius. He was, he was a prodigy um, and they found him in China mainland. And um, he was invited to Japan to become a pro there. He spent his whole life as a pro in Japan. Um, and he was like, when they found, found him basically, he was already pretty close to, I, I, I would say he was already professional strength. Mm. And that was a time when it was relatively uh, time consuming, more difficult to move up in the ranks, but he was one of the fastest um, in promotion. And very quickly, he started to challenge some of the top Japanese players. And he was a rival of the famous Kitani Minoru. So they, they were famous rivals and very good friends. And together, they, um, they researched the Shin Fuseki, the modern Fuseki, which um, was in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. They invented a new opening that was um, basically, it was, the general idea was to um, just ignore all the orthodox ideas that people had and start with something new. And Ghost Tegan's ideas there were based mostly on playing star points. So it might sound familiar. Before mm -hmm. that, um, people mostly played the three, four point, which is still a valid move, of course. It's the first move in a corner. But Kosegen thought it was an idea to play a star point and finish off the corner with one move and move quickly to the sides. And that sort of has become the normal way we play. It, and the computer programs like star points also. Um, so he was way ahead of his um, era. He was ahead of the time. And some of his ideas are still sort of valid when we're using computer programs to analyze games. So it's pretty amazing. Okay. And of course, his opponent, That's Yamabe, um, he was one of three young players who were trying to challenge Gosegan. In this game, he's a six stun professional. So you can see he's a bit junior to Gosegan, um, who was one of the first nine dons, actually. Um, it was a time when they didn't have very many nine dons. Um, and he was, they called him one of the three crows. There was this saying in Japanese, uh, three crows, which is meant to represent, it's sort of it's hard to get in English, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. means there are three um, sort of scary young players, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's... If, if you've um, ever seen crows, actually, it's, yeah. you can get it. It's, it can be scary. It can be scary. And so he was, he was considered a kind of a dangerous player, um, very talented, obviously, and unusual in some of the thing, the ways he played. He, he, he liked to get into a scrap, as you will see. He, he mm -hmm. did not take the easy way. And generally, his games got pretty interesting. The, the one thing that I, I read, I mean, I read about the Three Crows, which, of course, I love, but I also read this thing, and I couldn't find it anywhere else. I was wondering if you know about this. He was said to resign games early because he didn't like to take advantage of, of his opponent's mistakes. Is that is that really true? Um, it's sort of true, and it's sort of a joke. Like, um, he did resign a lot. Um, I think generally um, when he was not playing perfectly or he uh, thought – on the move that he was not playing his best. Right. He would want to resign fairly quickly. In fact, there was a game I played against him um, in which he resigned fairly quickly. And um, I think uh, he must have said, he, he liked to joke. Like ah. um, when he didn't want to go out drinking with newspaper reporters, like um, he, was, he challenged a number of titles. And so at that time, they had a lot of, um, they had an allowance, so they could take the players out and um, take them out boozing on the company's money, <laughs> the sponsors. It's about building relationships. Yeah, so um, he didn't really want to do that on the night before he had a game. Sure. Play. <laughs> and so he made it an excuse that his, his wife would not allow him to do that. So, so they, they wrote that up. Obviously, the, the reporters were, um, annoyed by the fact that they couldn't take him out. Right. Um, so they say they wrote that up, exaggerating it. And so there's this story about how he was um, uh, super afraid of his wife who controlled him completely. <laughs> so there's this story that goes around. And I think it's similar that he, um, at some point, he sort of joked that his opponent played such a lousy move that he, he resigned because of that. And I sort of doubt that he would say that seriously. 
Um, but it's a good, it's it's a good story. That, it's a story that floated around. Right. And the part cool. about him resigning early is true. Okay. <laughs> All right, so on with the game. And again, folks, uh, just feel free to jump in with questions, comments. I'll try to keep an eye on that. Um, any other uh, things that we should be looking for in this game? We know it's going to be a fight. Yeah, he, he's going to um, prompt a fight, yes. That's, okay. that's the basic point, yeah. It's, right. um, we're going to see, actually, he's going to play a Gosegen-like move. This is, Yamabe has black. And there's no Komi in this game. And this, uh, this, lark, this high Kakari, um, it was played by Gosegen. It was the Gosegen style. And it's sort of similar to uh, what we saw some computer programs playing when they played a shoulder hit after White played here. Because one of the options Black has now is to play away. Like Black could play something like this now. And so this would start to resemble. Um, variations that we see played by computer program. At least, um, I'd say the earlier ver uh, versions of computer programs, like Master, like the AlphaGo Master version, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which really like to play shoulder hits. I sort of doubt that Lila Zero and Katago would play this, this shoulder hit, actually. They, they don't do that so much. But this was an idea that Gosegen had a lot, so he, he would be doing this kind of stuff. But this is Yamabe playing it, you might say, against, he's doing it in reverse. And so White would usually, White usually has a choice of playing here or playing here, in which case Black would play, probably play here, or maybe um, one line lower, a, a pincer on the left side. Mm. And so the idea is that the pincer um, is combining with this Black stone to make a base for Black on the left side. Uh, but actually, Gosegen chose a different move. So um, other than this move, which is the most um, common move, or this move, which is also a common move, where would, where would you play if you wanted to choose, make a third choice? Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've shown you these two choices. Uh, what's a third choice that you might make? For, for white? For white. Hmm. Actually, there are a number of moves that White could play. But, yeah, um, I'm thinking about just a. Uh, you're thinking locally or Tanuki, and you know, go locally. somewhere else. Choose a local move. I mean, you know, I, I mean, you could contact directly, or I suppose like a C16. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, what about is the attachment at uh, C14 work at all? C14 is probably one of the choices that's not so good, actually. Um, yeah. I mentioned C16. That's that's a move that can be played. It's a bit um, passive. Right. So in this team where there's no Komi, you're probably not going to see White play that. Right. Um, what about D15? D15 is actually a fairly common move. Um, and Black would probably play here. And the question is whether Black's going to push on the fifth line. Black could play directly towards the side. Um, um, or Black could, um, otherwise Black could push here. In which case, White's probably going to cover here and play the hunting. But actually, this is a move. Um, playing the shoulder hit, this move, is a move that Gosegen liked also. And if Black is going to push immediately, White's going to play here and um, take a big corner. This, this gives White a very secure corner with a weakness there in Black's, in Black's wall. So um, this is probably good for White, and that's why I'm having Black play the slide first, and then probably just an extension. In which case, white can push here, and black gets the side territory. And it's just—it's very similar to that other move, where white was um, playing here. Only, in this variation, um, white has a, a taller wall. White has more potential on the upper side, while black has a more solid position on the left. So that those are some good um, choices, I guess. Um, I, I did want to say that this move it probably doesn't really work because Black can capture it with this. So, so this right. would be giving too much up and slight advantage for Black. But um, also White had uh, this option. This would be another option, pincering on the left side. Um, you could see that even in a modern game. But the move Gosegen played was this one. So I was wondering if you'd come up with this move. 
Yeah. <laughs> this is actually attachment, uh, yeah. that goes again light, and it involves a ladder. So the ladder it involves is if black plays here and extends towards the center, black is threatening to wedge um, at d16. So usually white's going to connect here. I mean, go down in the corner. So it's the ladder here, which at this point, it favors white. And black does, doesn't have time to play the ladder breaking move. This would be a ladder breaking move. But in this game position, the upper left is so important that it, um, it's just not going to work. Mm. So instead, black attack. So when the ladder is bad for black, attaching here is, I'd call it the standard move. Um, like the other choice would be to extend towards the corner, um, but attaching is more forceful. I, I like attaching better. And white plays here. This is this is actually a joseki that was played that time. And I was looking at this game uh, with Katago, and I was sort of surprised by the suggested move. Uh, this is the move that was played, and this is a joseki at the time. And so I'll, we'll get into that as we look at the game. But actually, Katago was suggesting this. And I was saying to myself, I've never seen that before. And But when you research these things, you find that um, in professional games, you can find that someone has played it after all. Like there's, there's almost no move you can find. All of these new moves the computer plays also, uh, they've been played by someone. Mm -hmm. Um, like all those new Josekis that Master was showing us, Master AlphaGo, um, even those had been played. It's just that they did not get popular, and and we had decided that they were not good for some reason. And so I found this in one game. Maybe there's a few games it was played. I, I found one game in which this move was played. Black's probably going to cut here. White connects and Black takes. That means White's going to have an op option to um, play. I've marked A and B here. So um, those were the choos two choices that Katago was giving me, to press at B or to press even more strongly at A. And it seems a reason, like the 3-3 three, three point is obviously a very important point here, um, extending into the corner like that. And so it, it seems reasonable for white. But I think at the time, people didn't like allowing uh, a capture towards this. it's sort of like a ponuki, even though it has that that there's this wasted stone here for black, so it's not strictly speaking a proper ponuki, but it is a very thick shape towards the center. People didn't like to allow that at the time. But I was um, this is a move that I would like to play actually. I think this is a good looking move. This I was no, it, it, it's yeah. uh, it's really solid and and uh, and and white. I like white because white is light in black's area. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, you're talking about this variation still, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in the game, this was the Joseki at the time, and black covers on the three three point, and this is sort of where it branches out. So in the game, white extended here. This is the most um, the good shape move. Usually black will answer it, answer it here. Um, and white will play a honey here. And something like this might um, happen. Uh, black might play that way or black might play the hanging connection. In which case black has a more solid shape with the cut in the corner. But white would, white would probably play away anyway, uh, playing this big point on the upper side. So black has a choice there. In the game, um, otherwise black could play here, but this uh, covering here would be a very big point in that case. So uh, this is the whole idea about the fight that's gonna start now. The fact that covering on the fourth line here is a really big move that will give white a lot of potential on the left side here. So that's why black usually plays the slide here, finishing it with one move. Um, just to go back one move here, if white really wanted to force that sequence, White could have played the double hane here. I was just going to ask about that, yeah. In which case, black would play a hane underneath. Uh, white doesn't really want to extend on the fourth line because that's um, pretty ugly on the outside and black would crawl anyway. So what white's going to do is white's going to, let's see, let's go back a couple of moves. White's going to connect here and black's going to extend. 
So the merit for white is that white has forced black to play down on the third line. Um, maybe something like this would continue. Black, white's forced that. But the drawback is that this exchange here of white stone on the fourth line and black stone on the third line, um, white would really prefer not to have that exchange in it. So it's a bad exchange that gets rid of white's potential on the side. So for instance, in the case that white has played the extension, in this case, when it's like this, you can get to the same position, right? It's the same position. Um, without this exchange here of white pushing through on the fourth line and black covering on the third line, uh, moves like this later, at some later point in the game, white might start with connecting here. Let's just have a, um, like if white plays moves like this, there's a lot more pressure on the black group. Um, when black plays stuff like this, there's the odds of this kind of thing. Um, making some trouble for white, for black. Um, it's just so much better not to have that exchange there, which has made black, given black a solid position. Also white could um, hope to be playing from, from this side, moves like this or moves like this. Obviously in this case, it's better for white not to have this exchange in basically. So that's the big difference. So it's a choice for white. White can choose to force, force that shape um, by playing the double honey or give the choice to black by extending it. So usually it was considered, I think it's still considered that this is the good suji, the good shape move. Mm. While this is a bit vulgar because it's forcing black and it gets rid of that, that extra potential for white when this happens. So this would be kind of a compromise for white. Uh, and white's sort of hoping for this situation. And this is where Yamabe shows um, how he likes a fight because he's gonna crawl here. Usually you don't crawl, on, crawl so much, but it is the fourth line after all. So I, I guess it's okay to crawl. And when he crawls here, he's just inviting white to at some point cover on the fourth line, at which point black is gonna cut. Whenever white covers on the fourth line, black's gonna cut here. And he doesn't care that that corner group looks a bit dangerous. Um, he, he's gonna handle that, um, but he just wants to cut on the fourth line. He wants to start a fight here. And if white extends, black's just going to keep on crawling. And like usually players would settle the position like this. This would just settle the position and calm things down. But um, he's showing that he doesn't want to do that. He wants to keep it exciting. And if white continues to extend, um, this is still the game sequence. If white continues to extend, this is where white covered. If white continues to extend, black might crawl once more. Eventually, Black's going to take the large point on the upper side. And Black's idea, now, now of course, this would not be forcing, and Black would probably play something on the, on the lower side. Black's idea is that Black is getting all the territory here, and White's wall is maybe not so effective. Right. And so Black has crawled a few times to make this space as small as possible. So Black has crawled as many times as he thinks White will answer him. And of course, when black is crawling like this, white doesn't have white doesn't have the potential to move away because playing a honey here is such a big big move. It's such an effective move. White has to answer it. So he's that's the difference between this move and and playing a knight's move. In which case, it's not so forceful, and white can play away because black doesn't have any good follow up. Right. So he's playing very forcefully here and sort of challenging white to a fight because if white extends here, I'm not so, so sure about crawling once more. I'm, I'm just gonna say black crawls just once more and, and plays the upper side, I think that works. Or he might play the upper side mm -hmm. immediately. So Bose again covered here and Yamabe gets his fight, he extends. At this point, the cut here is gonna be extremely, the cut uh, here is gonna be extremely Strong, so white has to protect there. And black invades. So if black can capture these two white stones, obviously that's going to be good. So um, what I'm talking about here is, for instance, if white plays something like this, black will just go after the two stones. And those two stones are pretty important. They, they, they're connected to all of the weak black groups. So they're much more important than anything that might happen in the corner. They're more important than capturing this white stone. So white uh, answered here, a very natural move. 
basically, if white does, uh, white might be tempted to play here, I guess. Black could answer that with the wedge or the, I, I think the wedge is probably better. Um, for instance, something like this would capture white in the corner. Or black could even play here. Um, that probably would, oh, sorry. That probably would work. Like if white plays here, black's gonna win this anyway. But the wedge is probably better. So to go back to the wedge variation, this one. This, this looks like it's gonna be a success for black. Uh, let's just connect here. So in the game, white uh, moved out and black played here. The, corner, the black group on the left is actually alive. And now it's alive with Sente. Black actually left this and played in the center. So um, this is a little uh, life and death problem here. It's yeah. actually alive um, because if basically if white curls here, um, white has, to, has this problem to deal with. So this would just capture the two white stones. So um, white has to... White well, probably has to start with something like this, I guess, and, and any move, I, I think any move lives here. Like for instance, this would be a line. Yeah. So I, um, yeah, I guess I was lucky there, it's alive. Wow. <laughs> okay, so it's alive. And so white switches back to this side. Um, white could have continued the fight in the center, but this is a very active way for white to play. And if black covers here, um, let's see. I think white would just connect underneath. So that would be, I guess, uh, maybe something like this. But the cut on the fifth line and this cut and this wedge here, they're interchangeable. Like if black cuts here, white can uh, reply um, to, to play the wedge here. This would be okay for white. Did someone just ask about pressing an e e4? Yeah, there's a question about pressing an e4, actually, yeah. the, uh, the lean. I, I sort of talked about that earlier. White just, yeah. just at this point, white doesn't have the opportunity. Um, just to go back a little bit further, when all of this stuff was happening, um, it was, it's already too late. Like the upper left is so, so hot that if white did it now, it would be too late. So white's only opportunity to play that uh, would have been before this move. So right. at this point, White could have played it. Uh, do you think I should turn uh, close the window? It sounds like somebody being called to prayer. Yeah. <laughs> Let's close the. Uh, just give me a second. All right. That'll give me a chance to remind folks you are watching live commentary with Michael Redman, Nine Don Professional. I'm Chris Starlock, managing editor of the American Go e Journal. Thanks very much for joining us on our uh, live Sunday night series, uh, which means that you can ask us questions and uh, we will do our very best to uh, answer uh, your questions or just make comments. Uh, a lot of you I know watch the videos uh, either on the, uh, our, the AGA's YouTube channel or on uh, Michael's YouTube channel, which has been blowing up in a, in a good way. So uh, if you had things you want to ask him here, um, not about clickos, just a little sensitive about that at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anything else is, uh, is is fair game. So, um, yeah. So your point, and I think uh, you, you yeah. Actually, so I could have played it here at this point. Black would have answered, but right. obviously that, that's going to change what happens in the upper left too. Like if, if white did the same thing, even if we assume the same variation, this time black is not going to pick a fight. So black's going to play a more conservative variation. And then at least at the time, uh, we would be thinking that maybe um, this exchange here in the lower left is giving black too much. That was how we thought about it at the time. Sure. I'm sure that white would be perfectly OK if you asked a, a modern computer program. But at the time of this game, people felt that playing that pressing move at one was a local loss for white. And just remind folks, this game was played in 19... Uh, let's see, it was played... 50-something, um, I think. 1950-something. Let's see if I can figure that out. 55, maybe? Before I was born, I know that. 
Maybe 50. Uh, um, let's see. I, I'm not sure I know, actually. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up while you're out uh, being in the game. But the point is, just, just sort of remind folks of what was what was going on in, in 1950s. So they're still sort of looking at some different openings. Um, you know, what's 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 sort of the, the thing that's happening and and and, and japan of course in the 1950s is right, dominating 1953 53 yeah yeah so um this was after the the new fuseki the that um Gosegen invented um and that only lasted um for about 10 years it lasted about a decade um, where people were playing really crazy openings. And in the end, it was just Gosegen's opening, which um, played a lot of star points and which sort of survived. So that was really the base from which people made openings like the San Nense, the three stars in a row, or the Chinese opening also. Um, it really came, basically, all of those openings, the modern openings that use star points came from Gosegen's new opening, his, his Shin Fuseki. But at the time, they didn't really like pressing at one so much. And, it's, and so in that way, it was an interesting question because um, people who have studied with computer programs like Lila Zero or Katago um, will have the tendency to want to play that immediately. Mm. But the, the players at the time did not think that was good. It just loses all the other options that White had in the area. So there, there is a negative side to it. Right, right. So, so that question. was maybe the one one opportunity for white to play this one. Um, otherwise, after all this gets started, it's just too, um, too sharp and upper left for white to do. So right. back to the game. Yep. So this is where, um, oh yeah, we're, we're a bit ahead of this, aren't we? So black's alive in the corner, just barely alive, but obviously he read that out. And he doesn't want to allow white to connect underneath like this um, because white would just be alive there. Um, so he's going to extend here. And they get into this huge fight where basically Black is willing to take some loss in the lower left corner if Black can capture white stones on the side. Yeesh. Wow. An example of that would be, for instance, white pushing through. If white pushes through, Black is just going to push through. And with the idea of um, cutting off those stones on the side. So like if white does something like this, Black's just going to take them. In fact, white might connect here. And this yeah, is yeah, really, yeah. really exciting. Like this, this kind of fight, it's locally, it's pretty dangerous for white. Um, but white might be able to try to, to squeeze, like uh, white has, uh, white can play once here, for instance, and uh, black's gonna answer, it's a question, whether black connects on the star point or maybe here. Uh -huh. And after this, white has various options. Like um, I actually didn't make a variation for this, do you think it's going to be too complicated? Like white has a choice of playing here and trying to live in the corner or playing here and trying to squeeze from outside. I so don't like, I don't room. like either choice. This is just white is really, really busy. Like something like this. Um, let's see. I think I made a variation, something like this, where white um, sacrifices those stones, has a bit of Aji with a potential coal here threatening to come down here and has a potential attack in the center of the board. Um, for instance, with something like this. So actually, um, although the game is probably good for black, if we um, we take in, if we count the fact that there's no Komi, there's no Komi in this game, so it's, it's mm -hmm. still good for black. I would say white's probably catching up a little bit. So if, like if it was a five and a half or six and a half Komi game, um, maybe it would already be okay for white, even if white throws away the corner like this. So this would be an example of how white might play. Um, otherwise, white is sort of looking at that honey in the corner. So, and I'm talking about the honey here. There is some potential for white to um, play here and try to make a living shape in the corner. So, black would have to do something about the cut there. This would be one way to get rid of the cut because if white cuts now, black can just capture all of the white stones. And, and white would be able to live in the corner. Um, something like this. Actually, it looks like black can capture from outside. Um, 
But this would be just bad for white on the outside. And because those white stones in the center of the board, they're really weak. So I don't like this so much for white. Um, and I sort of like this variation better, whereas, and, and this gets really exciting. I, I can show you another uh, stone. Uh, stone pillar, uh, one of those Japanese gravestone uh, tesujis. And this would be actually just good for white. Um, because black you should, you should, you should show people what you're talking about. It's this shape. Yeah. Um, usually it's just that black clump of stones on the second and first lines, and then the two black stones on the third and fourth line, they form mm -hmm. the shape of a tombstone. Right. And it's called the tombstone tesuji, in which white squeezes, sacrificing those two stones. And in this case, white can cover here, and black is going to lose those, the whole group. So <laughs> this would be bad for black. In actual black play, black would actually, um, if black gets this far in the variation, that's why I was having black capture the white group with this move. But if white does, um, if black does get into this variation, black could still win by curling around here. Okay. Oh, maybe, I, maybe not even that. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think that's going to work for black. Um, just because white's so weak on the outside too. White would probably just sacrifice everything here. Um, but would have, uh, this would probably be okay for white. White might even, um, might, might even be able to play away. Wow. So white would sacrifice something there, but would be getting something back on the lower side. So I think this looks uh, playable for white. So there's all this stuff that could have happened, but in the game, oh, I'm, I'm having trouble getting back to the game for each So yeah, I got a bit, Carried away. Um, no, so that you. could have happened. And that would have been interesting. Instead, white wedges here. So with, with this wedge, white's idea is to play here next. And if black plays here, obviously this is a lot better than the previous variation. But white's going to sacrifice this, but it's going to get a lot back in the corner. Like white, uh, I guess white's going to play here. So this is slightly better for white, having that exchange of this white stone for black one here. It just gives white that much better a shape in the corner. So white would be able to sacrifice uh, the side stones in this game, would be pretty much even. And black instead pushes here, white extends. At this point, it looks like white is sacrificing the side. Like if black plays here um, and here, uh, this is just, um, the easy way for black to capture white. White would add a stone. I think black would add another stone too. This trade is actually good for black. It's uh, good enough for black. Um, probably even in a, a game with Komi, I think this would be good enough for black. Just the thickness that black gets from capturing these stones. Um, but it would not be a complete disaster for white. I think in a Komi game, it would still be very close. Obviously, since there's no Komi, it's, it would still be uh, a winning position for black in this but he did not do that. He, now this is where Yamabe shows, sort of he shows his style in the way he's going to try to set up some crazy uh, squeeze, which actually is going to work in this game. So he plays this, giving up a lot of territory in the corner, and he's going to try to capture white on a large scale. So what Black did here is that he established forcing moves at the two mark points, uh, which are reinforcing, reinforcing the connection of the black group on the side here, these black three stones to the stone he's just played. So um, with forcing, stone, forcing moves at either this point or this point, black doesn't have to worry about the connection there. So white played here. This is where white um, could have played here and just sacrificed to a certain degree. Like if black plays here, um, Black does have to do something to stop white from connecting underneath here. So that's what this move is doing. Um, it's probably dead, um, but uh, there is, um, it, it's, there's some possibility of a squeeze there when white pushes through and cuts. Um, and it got a bit confusing when I uh, tried to work this one out. So I left it there. I think it's satisfying enough for Black that Black has captured it. So this is how Black is planning to capture it. And White moved out. 
And this is where the squeeze starts. So he's, he's played all these moves to sit up. Basically everything Black did in this corner was to make this move work. So um, including the attachment he just played. Mm -hmm. So he's setting up this squeeze. Basically it was just that he wanted to squeeze like this. Um, and it's sort of, um, for Yamabe, I think it, it doesn't really matter whether it's a good result or not. He just wanted to squeeze. And you can see the squeeze itself has, has succeeded. And white escapes in the center, but black still has this wedge here. And at this point, um, although white's, white actually has potential to connect here um, with a co, actually, it, it's going to be a co. So that's dangerous for white. Um, but white does have that move. But it's not very effective now when white's group in the center is so much, it's a, it's a lot of stones now. It's five stones in the center. So right now, the center group is, has become more important than anything that might happen on the left side. It means white has to add a stone to that center group. So black played here, and white added a stone to the center group. And now black is just going to add one stone, just, just to get rid of all the Aji, all the potential for white to create um, a race to capture with this black group on the outside. Black finishes it up. This whole thing was, um, black gave up a lot in the corner. And it's actually a pretty balanced result. Um, it's pretty even, actually. So black is happy because he's captured the, the cutting stones. Like the whole idea that black had was that black was that capturing these two stones would connect all of black's groups. And because of that, they would, that would be really effective. And basically that's a valid idea. But in the process, black has been given up, has given up a lot in the corner. So I'd say it's about even. With, with no Komi, I'd say it's still good for black. Uh, but maybe white has caught up a little bit. Um, you, but you can see how you get the idea that Yamabe likes to play sort of exciting games. Yeah. Um, saying that, I think this move he played was a bit slack. Yeah. And he could have played out into the center. That would have been better. Just, Just because this group on the left is so strong. And white extends on the upper side. Um, Kadabo actually wanted black to invade here. Huh, really? Um, right away. The peeping here is going to be, it's, it's pretty much a forcing move now. Um, just to go back to the corner situation, like I, there was a point where I was saying that white would attack black's corner by taking here. Right. So there was a, a point in the game when this looked like it was going to be forcing, but it's not forcing anymore because black has captured these stones. So that's important um, in regards to the fight on the outside. Because when white cannot play that, that peep there, or even cutting here, are going to be an option for black. So for instance, like if white um, plays something like this to try to attack black, um, black could even cut here and then cut here um, to put more pressure on white on the outside. Something like this, maybe. So black does have potential to cut white, and in the process, um, black would probably make a living shape inside. So that's what the idea behind this move is. In the game Black played here, um, you can see he's still focused on that white group in the center of the board. And so for most of the middle game, Black is going to be chasing that white group around. It's very much like his style, I think. He's, he's, he likes to be in the, on the attacking side. Um, he doesn't really mind the fact that white's going to get the upper side. He just wants to continue attacking. Wow. You know, there's some felt, there, there, it's a strategy. It's a good strategy to be attacking. There's a lot of extra value there. And now this move, this is just sort of, um, it's just, it's vintage Yamabe. Yamabe. It's um, the key point here. Um, but usually people don't play it uh, when there's so many weak stones in the area. Like you, the normal person would be thinking whether to connect here, which is not very satisfying in this board position because white gets into the right side. And uh, because of that, black would be thinking of playing maybe a double hane to map out some territory in this area. I think this, even for a professional player, this would be the normal way to, to think about this situation. 
but instead he just ignores the fact that his stone his, he's about to be cut here and he plays here. This is a key point. And why is it a key point? First of all, black cannot cut there immediately because if black cuts, white's just gonna chase the ladder and capture these two stones. So that would not be very successful for black. Um, and so black peeps. When black peeps here, you would usually have white playing a hanging connection here, but this would not solve white's problem because black would still have the tari here to cut white. And so the idea that it's going to force white to play something like this, which is really a, a very slow move, then black could play this one. And you can see that um, it's making a difference there. And that um, this area here is, it's like it's almost one eye, it's not two eyes. Whereas if black had done that immediately, if black had done that immediately, then this area for white, it would be um, at least one eye and close to two eyes. Like one more white move will, will make it two eyes. So there's a big difference when black plays this vital point first, forcing white to play, for instance, something like this to save the stones. A, a super effective shape move. But white, um, for the time being, white ignores it. So white's idea here is that if black does something like this, white's probably just gonna play another move in the center and sacrifice, uh, let's see, that's uh, eight stones, sacrifice eight stones. Wow. There's, there's still a bit of Aji here, black has to deal with the attachment here. Or, or even it, once white has played it two, actually white can just play an Atari here next. And that would be troublesome for white. So black will need to add another move to it. And that means white's gonna get the whole, white's gonna have an advantage on the right side. So that would be actually good for white. And instead black plays here and continues in the center. He's not gonna give up that stone. White still has to do something about the cut at um, K9. So this is the game move. Maybe better for white to play here. Um, it's actually very, um, very similar, but maybe better for white to play like this and then connect. And white has that potential connection at, at A. Um, in the game, when white connects here first, um, like this, for instance, just to simplify it and say white connects here, when white does that and then does this, which is still a key point, black is not gonna connect at the mark point. Black is just going to capture the one stone on the ladder. So when white plays at three later, it's not gonna be forcing. That's why that where the idea comes of playing this first and forcing black to answer or connecting here. I think I like this. I think this is better for white because white does have that connection at A or any move on the right side somewhere around here would be a ladder breaking move, which would be fairly forceful in this position. In the game, white um, wedged here and then cut. Um, but this actually probably better not to play all those moves. Um, I like this variation better because it's a liability for black and not so much for white. Whereas in the game, when white does this, black is getting a relatively thick position in the center of the board. So I don't like the exchange of these two white stones for these two blacks. I think this is where black's lead is sort of getting more solid. Um, white plays to the right side and black added a stone in the center. And it's, um, I would have played from this side, um, but this, um, actually this is the variation I got with Katago, um, something like this. Um, this is the thicker move, the variation goes on. Um, black is getting some, uh, this is basically um, what black is doing with 11 and 13 is reinforcing the area so that black can deal with white extending here or attaching here. There's, there's various moves that would link up to white escaping here. And after reinforcing there a little bit, black is going to play at A. So that's, that's this point that I've marked here, L13, um, to try to cut white off in the center. Um, so black could have done that. This move is a bit more flashy and that it's 
inducing white to move out. And actually it's not even saving this black stone. So that makes it more dangerous for black also, but um, he's willing to take a, a local loss if he can um, sort of make it into an invasion on the right side. So black is trying to invade the right side instead. And there's really no reason why he couldn't have played from this side. He just wants white to run out to make it more interesting, I think. It's just, just his style. You can see black is losing points in the center of the board and giving white a potential eye there. Um, but he does get the momentum sort of to attack on the right side. Um, the computer programs actually agreed with this move only they wanted black to play at A first. So they, um, Kadago wanted black to play here. And then if white plays here, black plays here anyway. So it's very subtle. It's a slight difference which makes it, it, it makes a difference when white plays moves like this and black plays like this, and it gets, um, it heat, the fight there heats up. Sometimes that stone at one comes into play. And white extends, black extends. White does not have enough room to live locally. And so white plays this move. So with um, curling around here, it looked like Gosegen was playing away, but actually, um, part of it is white, um, that was a forcing move for black. If black had played at some point, if black had played here, it would have been a forcing move. It's just that it loses the odds. You didn't want to play it yet because that would um, make it that much easier for white to live in the center of the board. He didn't want to play that yet. So this is taking away that forcing move, also creating a cutting point here, which is um, which black has to be careful of. So white plays an attachment underneath and black covers. So if black uh, comes on this side, you can see that white is, white is getting somewhere, I guess. White can play here and here um, and is making, the, the black stones in the center now are, have only one eye. And so white's gonna be able to use that to make a living shape. So black covers on the outside and plays, now plays this move. So again, you can see he's sort of dancing around a little bit, being fancy. If white cuts here, um, then uh, black can use the, the squeeze here, which is very effective already, but also um, it means that black is setting up another squeeze on this side, which will just connect all of black's stones and, and reinforce black to the extent that uh, now black can do just about anything on the upper side. I could start with something like um, going through, going straightforwardly like this, maybe it doesn't work. Uh, it looks like white can probably connect up, but black can just attach somewhere. Like for instance, black could start with this and do a lot of damage to the upper side at least. Yeah, there's a related question about whether that, that upper side is, is white, is really white territory. What do you think? No. Yeah. Um, it depends on how black wants to deal with it. Like um, since the upper right area, this area is going to be probably a black territory. Sometimes it pays for black to do something like, like 12 that I'm showing here, which is going to be an attempt to uh, expand the upper right and just reduce white on the upper side. So something like this would be um, an end game play in which black is increasing his own territory while reducing whites. Otherwise, in some game positions, um, you could see black do something drastic like this, which um, would be even possible in this board position um, because locally, I think there's uh, a good chance that black's gonna die. But if black can get forcing moves uh, from the center, then that could allow black to kill white in the center. Right. And there's also a lot of complication again with the cut here, which is gonna be a bit of a headache for white too. So like if black could, um, maybe we could have black play something like this and then cut, you can see that it's gonna get dangerous for white. This, this actually would be already alive. So um, if we had white play an Atari from underneath maybe, this still would be troublesome with the forcing move here and the potential cut here. Even locally it's, um, it's not simple for white to kill this black group. 
And with the, the fact that this group in, in the center here, if it gets cut off, obviously it's gonna die. So there's that problem that white has all. And it looks very dangerous for white. It so this would actually dangerous. be a board position. Yeah, it would be a board position where black could actually dive in all the way here with this move. And well, that was my attempt to explain. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's very complicated. Yeah, it is complicated. But I think, you know, the point is, uh, you know, there are things to look at there and certainly, you know, black can die. But I think the point is that you're looking at, there's some, there's some uh, action around the uh, K-15 white stone. Uh, right. There's a possible, there's the cuts at F-16. Uh, so lots of, there's, that's, those are the kinds of things to look at. It's just this, this, this weak white group in the center of the board Right. It has to do with it. Like if that white group was strong, it would um, probably be a different story. Sure. Um, but jumping in at points uh, like that, let's just uh, show you the point again. Like jumping in here, um, usually it's dangerous for black, really scary. Um, in an actual game with time um, controls, it would be really, it would be difficult for both sides, but it would be especially difficult for me as black to read out all the variations and find the one that lives. So it's, um, it would be a very scary way to play. Um, apart from the fact that in this board position, black does have options. Um, after this move, black has options of trying to kill white in the center, which would make it a lot more effective. It's not the way that, um, it's not the way that Yamabe went about it, actually. It, 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 we ended up with a similar position where white was not completely safe in the center. So black is using this sequence here in the center to get rid of the cut on the third line here because there's still potential for black to attack white on the side here. If white plays the next move, if white plays here at some point, I would say this is alive. But if black, uh, for instance, black would probably play, uh, locally black would probably play something here and then here, or it could change the order. Black could play from this side and then play here. Um, this shape is uh, basically not alive locally. But you have to remember that white has created this, this weakness here, which is going to cause complications. So black plays here. Uh, basically, black is trying to get, just because of the fact that white has this cut to look at, black is getting out, splitting white in two on the lower side. So black, black is splitting through here, putting some pressure on white stone in the corner and keeping this group in the center, keeping this group isolated as much as possible. Um, because at this point, it's a bit premature for black to try to kill this white group on the right, this group here. Locally, black can kill it. Locally, it doesn't have eyes, but um, it's sort of scary for black when black has this, uh, the cut here. So black is trying to deal with that. And black's main idea is to continue attacking white in the center here. Mm -hmm. Of course, threatening at the, in the meantime, black is threatening white's corner. So it's getting really very um, exciting here. White um, plays here. Uh, locally, black can cut white off with this move, but then of course, white would have, for instance, moves like this to, that would eventually cut black off again, or white might actually do it this way. This would cut black off, for instance. This would be a complete disaster for black. Actually, black would push yeah, yeah, yeah. here. It would be a different type of fight. Black connects, allows white to connect underneath. And you can see now the, the real focus for black is on white's group in the center. And connects, yeah. This move, I sort of question this move. It's really hard to decide in positions like this between this move and capturing the one stone. Because if black gets to squeeze uh, from this side, it's gonna be really painful for white. If black gets to squeeze from this side. That's like it's white's played a dominant point. So there's a ten, this is much better as a shape move. But um, for instance, if white gets to connect up to, to these stones, then it's gonna be three points there in this position. So in this case, connecting would be the better move. Um, so in a way, I think Gosegan sort of realizing that he is, has not really caught up with the, the fact that he doesn't have Komi 
And so Black still seems to have a slight advantage at this point. He's, he's just trying for more. He's, he's sort of making a gamble here that this move is going to be better. If white, it's going to be better if white can make an eye on the lower side or connect up to the corner or something like that. There's also the added value that when white plays something like this or something like this, um, these black stumps, there's an, it's filling the liberty of these black stumps. Sometimes that will count in, in white's favor. It's really hard to give you an, a concrete example there because these are all things that will happen sometime in the future, depending on how the game continues. Sure. So black finally plays here, uh, getting rid of the cut here and um, threatening white in the center because of that. So actually black's attack was not successful in that it did not kill white, but black was getting some extra territory in the general area and you remember there was a point where that right side looked like it would be a white territory. So mm -hmm. black, in this variation, black it, um, with these forcing moves here, you can see that black has pressed white down to the second line almost throughout the whole side. And black is actually getting um, a similar amount of territory here as that white is getting on this side. So it's, um, black has made some territorial um, gain and white plays the all-out move here. This move is a very strong move where white should really be worried, more worried about the center, um, but he can't afford to, to put a stone in. Like if white played something like a more conservative move like this, for instance, white would be perfectly alive in the center, but that would not be good enough in this. Black would just take the territory. So white's gonna try for more. And black, um, Black played here. So Black had a number of ways that Black could have, like Black could have played this move now. And I don't really know what's going to happen here. <laughs> White tries to kill it. It's, it's still going to be an issue with the center and the upper side being a kind of a double threat here. Like this, this kind of stuff could happen. Black is threatening to play here and cut White off. Yeah. Um, so, and now Black is threatening to cut here. So uh, this is an example of how black could, could connect up. Um, so actually this, is, uh, this point is still a valid, it's still a valid invasion. Black could have started here. I think if white plays something on the top, this is gonna be relatively easy for black to, to make a life here. Black still has the, the idea of cutting here and then cutting here, which will give black some space on that percent. So actually black could have done that. And so I gave you an example there, but to be completely honest, I don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> right, right. In the game black played from the center. And this is pretty effective too, because it's not really clear how white's going to connect. White played here. Basically if white plays on the right, it looks like white's trying to connect, um, but there's gonna be a hole on either side, basically. White plays on this side, Black's gonna push through and cut. And if white plays on the other side, um, black's gonna get into that territory. And it's gonna be really difficult for white to save any of that territory with the threat of a cut here. Um, so on the game, white plays here, counterattacking, and black plays here. So black is pretty much connected up. Black is pretty much connected up to the left, to the right here. Um, and is still threatening to cut at this point. You know, a little dicey here, isn't it? Yeah, very much. Um, so this is a point where if white connects here, black's going to push through, um, maybe something like that, or something like this. This might be better. Black uh, pushes through once and plays here. Black, connect, uh, black has plenty of room to live inside now. So maybe something like this. I think this is what would have happened. So instead, white continues to try to attack, but has to play here. This, so this is trying to reduce the damage on the upper side. Uh, for, so basically, if when black plays here, now this is going to be a forcing move. So in this case, white could extend here, and it looks like white's gonna be able to hang it, hang together maybe. 
It still looks dangerous, but yeah. It sure maybe does. The final move should be here. Uh, it looks like it's going to maybe not be so bad as it could have been. So Black just pushes through. And he plays here. Um, very solid move. Um, he had various ways to go in, but this is a very thick move. It, it seems valid enough. To me. And White basically has no follow-up on the upper side. It's just with the, with the cut here um, and all of these weaknesses on this side, it's just very difficult for White to surround the side. So White starts with this. So like if Black is going to answer here, then white wants to have this exchange in first before playing something like that. If white plays something like that first, uh, then um, black would be able to play moves like this later. And black will get the upper right corner and will have reduced white on the side. So right. that's the basic idea. So white's making me eye of the side and the corner. And black is putting pressure on white still. So white had to answer there. And now black finishes off um, the side. Oof. Finally, we're ending the game. I, I'm, I'm, it, it actually was a very close game. Yeah. Uh, but the fighting is over at last. Wow. So um, I'm sort of over. Why don't we look at the rest of the, the game moves? In a, in a game like this where they fight so much, usually they fill up most of the space. So the end game... For instance, in this game, like you have these very basic end game moves on the right side, uh, the left mm -hmm. side, sorry. Um, and then the only difficult end game areas will be, for instance, this area and, and this area. So when you have a fighting game like this, um, you find that once the fight is over, the game is sort of suddenly in the final stages of the end game. And so black is finishing off the lower side. White plays this Yosei sequence on the left side. And at this point, it's pretty much, pretty much finished already. Like the, the upper side is decided. And the, the right side area, it's not going to be much territory anyway. So that's why the players have left it for a while. The end game here makes sense. Like, um, I think it's good enough. And Black's going to win by two points. Oh, wow. It's really close. Really close. So this was an example. Um, and you see Black did eventually get to squeeze, from, squeeze this, yeah. this white group. So, uh, that's the kind of thing, um, Yamabe, Yamabe was a player who was really, he liked the good shapes and stuff like that. So he, quite often, he would um, prefer the good shape to, to big territory. Mm -hmm. And I think we're sort of seeing that in this game where he sort of, he forced the variation where he got the squeeze from the outside, giving White a lot of territory. That's something like 25 points of territory in the corner that White got. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember that started out being a black territory, a black corner, that is. And the way he played the center, the fight in the center also, you can see he was um, more interested in the, the good shapes, the active shapes. Um, and he took the territory in the final stage of the game. Right? So the, the profit that black got here, breaking into white's upper side, came as the final step. And so it's a, a very typical example of a player who likes to attack. Um, you usually generally in a um, full board attack like this, it usually pays off to take the profit as the final step. It just takes a lot of reading to make it work. Right. So it seems like one of the things to be to be thinking about for for modern uh, audiences or modern players is the you know, the attacking is fine, but you need to attack with a purpose, with a plan. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, frankly, you know, sometimes I've been guilty of this, you know, just attacking is obviously fun and, uh, you know, can, can work out in some interesting ways. Uh, yeah. You know, this was a very, this was, I have to say, reminded me of, of AlphaGo in terms of, I did not see, maybe I missed it, but I did not see any obvious mistakes on either side. 
that would seem like very solid play, right? Well, if you, um, I did investigate this with um, Kadavo actually. Um, I use right. Kadavo one more now. Um, only it's partly because it gives a point score as well as the um, the percentage score. Sure. But um, so I, I get an idea of what the territory looks like, mm -hmm. and I pretty much trust that. Actually, um, I think that's pretty accurate. Accurate. Um, but also the fact that I think it seems that Katabo is just getting stronger and stronger, and it's probably stronger than Leva Zero now. It's really hard to tell with these computer networks because when they play each other. Um, sometimes they're just hitting sort of almost bugs in the other program, they're hitting weak points. And Leela has some, some pretty, Leela Zero has some weak points that pretty, that sort of stick out. Like it's, it's still sometimes, depending on what network you're using, and that changes all the time. Uh, Leela still sometimes has trouble with ladders and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so, um, and actually, when, when, when you're studying the game, that's not a problem if you're aware of those, those weak points and you can allow for them to a certain degree. Um, but it probably does make Leela weaker when it's playing other computer programs. Like, I think there was a, a time when Kadawa was getting Leela zero in a, a ladder situation every time. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, um, so I'm using Kadawa a lot. And when you use programs like that, you will find especially in games from this era, um, you will find what are moves that lose points in the score. In fact, mm. even in modern Go, uh, the, the point score, the, the score that the computer gives you is going to fluctuate, even if you're a top professional. Mm -hmm. So um, looking, looking at it that way, there were mistakes. You can say there were mistakes. Okay. But, um, I think it's important in this game that Black was very persistent and he kept the same idea. Like a computer program usually is not like that. It, it's pretty hard to tell what it's trying to do sometimes because it's very fluid and um, flexible. And it's more flexible than um, is often possible for human players because the plan changes with every move and that makes sense. But um, in actual play, when you have time controls and you're a human player with emotions and stuff, it's really hard to actually do that. I think it's very practical for a player to have a game plan um, that, is, that you keep with. And so it makes sense to you. In this game, it's very obvious that Black had a game plan that he wanted to keep that center, that white group in the center of the board isolated and keep putting pressure on it. And he had the, um, you might say he had the faith that eventually something would amount from that. And that did not mean he had the whole sequence read out. It, mean that it just meant that he had the feeling that eventually he must be able to get something out of that attack. Um, and he actually did. And it just happened that way. Um, there are so many ways it could have happened. It's just impossible for a human to calculate. But he, um, just from his experience in playing Go, he just knew that it that something if he, if he didn't mess up, there, there was something that had to happen. Question from, from one of our viewers. Uh, it's an interesting one. Wants to know if, if this uh, is fighting spirit by Black or just a love of fighting. And I'm, I'm not sure that there is a difference. What do you think? Um, well, in the case of Yamabe, I think he just loved to fight. And he loved to... He loved to to play the Tetsuji move. You love, you love to play the shape move. So I think you're seeing that a lot of that in this game. Um, fighting spirit like um, is sort of the same thing, but it's also a bit harder to define. Sure. And um, like computer programs do not have emotions. Right. But they play moves that can be associated with what we call fighting spirit. Because mm -hmm. like if, if you follow your opponent around, um, your opponent is going to take advantage, um, advantages, local advantages, and overall um, full board advantages. Mm -hmm. So quite often, sometimes you do have to play what we call the fighting spirit move. And you can find logical reasons for that, which do not involve um, spirit or emotions or anything like that. Mm -hmm. 
and that's how I would explain the reason why the computer programs do them do that kind of move also, because they're very logical. There, there's a logical reason to be playing away or um, playing um, actively when you could play passively and seem to get away with it. Mm -hmm. So um, when I study with computer programs, as I do this, I'm, I'm finding it harder and harder um, to define the term fighting spirit. You know? Yeah. Like, it's a very Japanese-like idea, I think. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it doesn't really fit very well in English anyway. <laughs> I, I have long thought that it's a it's a squishy it's a squishy term, but you know I, I think that we as players uh, like it. Um, uh, one one other question before we go, uh, and I think you addressed this earlier, but uh, some folks might have missed it uh, about whether you had played with Mabi. And I think uh, yeah, yes, I played you're... one game against him. Um, and actually, um, I was planning to do a short video on that in on my channel. Okay, um, it's probably not. Um, it's a, it was an interesting. Um, we got into a position in when I invaded the three three point, uh, his star point corner, and it actually looks sort of similar to the the Josekis that we've come up recently. So it was he he played a slightly different way, and we ended up in a position that was very close to what we now call the direct three three point invasion. Mm. Um, so it was interesting in that way, and. Um, yeah, so I, I think I'll do a, a video on my own channel for that. Um, so I did play him, and he did resign early. <laughs> and I was thinking that maybe I'd played a bad move. Uh -huh. That's the that I was worried about. And, and I wasn't sure. At the time, I think I was still um, not so experienced. Looking at it now, I can see that I was winning the game. Right. I, I wasn't so sure. I was maybe sort of overawed because of my opponent being uh, a player I had great respect for. Of course. Um, and I wasn't so sure that I was going to win the game at the time. So I was sort of surprised when he was in. Wonderful. Well, it's a great game. And I really, we had talked about this, you know, we, we love the, uh, the, the really, really old games. I, I, Maybe because when I was studying pro games, I looked at a lot of these games from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So I'm I'm very happy to be to be looking at these games. And I think there's a, a lot to be gained from from these games. I think they're overlooked by a lot of players, frankly. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's 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 good to have those. But wonderful as always, Michael. Thank you, and uh, great to have you all watching. Thanks so much. Uh, big thanks to uh, Jared, our producer. Uh, Eva D as well. Uh, we will be back next week, uh, Sunday, same time. And as mentioned earlier, we'll have a game from the uh, a modern game just played from the uh, the ongoing uh, ING tournament. So that'll be exciting. We'll uh, watch the uh, usgo.org. We'll, uh, we'll have something later in the week uh, with details on what game. Uh, that will be, of course, uh, watch our YouTube channel. We are continuing our endless uh, uh, AlphaGo versus the World Series. Uh, those, I think, are, we had a lot of fun doing those. They're very short, um, you know, 10, 12, 15 minute uh, analyses of the, the Master Series. So I hope if you guys have anywhere near as much fun watching them as we did making them, then we'll all be happy. Uh, and of course, and uh, we've had links there, you know, check out uh, Michael's uh, YouTube channel. He's been posting lots and lots of uh, really entertaining and fun content. So um, we were just trying to keep everybody uh, occupied and busy and hopefully getting stronger during the pandemic. So, you know, just uh, everybody stay safe out there. And uh, this is a good time to study and to, and to check things out. Right, Michael? Exactly. All right. All right. Thanks again, everybody, for watching usgo.org for all things go. Stay safe out there. We will see you all next week. Thanks again for watching.